Dr. Burt, thank you so, so much for coming on one last time to answer just a couple more questions that we had um, that we didn't get to ask the first time around. Plus, um, I know I have gotten feedback from a lot of people. Um, the good news is a lot of people listen to the prior two episodes, uh, people who have already had HSCT, people who are looking into HSCT are already booked for HSCT. So. Some of them already knew your stance on certain things and others are freaking out. And I I understand that, but I that's why I wanted to have you back to ask specific questions that I know that the people who are, are freaking out, uh, the questions that they might have to just be a little more specific. Plus, um, Jody has a couple of things. But I wanted to start with one thing that we didn't cover on the last one that was on my list. And when I flipped the page over, I was like, oh, I forgot to ask him this. And that was on second transplants. Dr. Fedorenko in Russia has had a handful of second transplants. When I say second transplant, that's somebody who's had HSCT, was a non-responder, um, and then came back to him and said, can I do it again? You know, maybe they saw some relief for a year or two, and then it was no long, you know, their MS started to progress. I know personally of at least one person that you've done a second transplant on. Tell me what, it didn't work the first time, what would lead a doctor to think it might happen the second time? And I do know Dr. Fedorenko now has a different protocol for a second transplant than he does for the first. So I think it's interthecal or something like that. But anyway, what what would make you think lead you to believe that a second time might be just the ticket? So if it didn't work the first time, I would not repeat not do it a second time. The question is why didn't it work the first time? And then I would have to question: Did you really get the right stage of the diagnosis? Was this really relapse remitting MS, or? less responsive, but still does respond to active secondary progressive MS. In other words, were you taking someone who was non-active secondary progressive MS where it doesn't work? And I've kind of put that in publications repeatedly. So no, if it did not work the first time, I would not attempt a second transplant. I would first and foremost try to figure out if I had the correct diagnosis, perhaps it's not even MS, or the correct um, there are many, many demyelinating diseases out there that can mimic MS. MS is the most common one, but there are many. I've had people referred to me for transplant for MS by neurologists who had adrenal leukodystrophy, usually seen in children, but can be seen in an adult. So <clears throat> if it doesn't work the first time, I would look for another cause. Sometimes people not unusual we always get a cervical spine mri when they come for evaluation and have found people to have uh, compression on the spinal cord from slip discs uh, that are causing a long a lot of the uh, spasticity and long track symptoms that they're having and that needs surgical intervention that's not ms now they may also have ms with that but they would still and we would recommend the surgical intervention first to try to correct that. So uh, I would kind of step back and wonder if it was the correct diagnosis and I would not do another one. That's not to say I don't know these cases. So I have no idea if it was the correct diagnosis or not. And the the doctor you happen to mention, Dr. Fedorenko, I've met him. He's an excellent doctor. I respect him. So I have no idea. It's just, I wouldn't do that. And I would question if the diagnosis is correct. Now, when you say I've done it twice before, that's for people where it did work, but then they okay. relapsed. So they were really aggressive relapsing, remitting, lots of enhancing lesions. 
And both of them went from a wheelchair to running again. And for one, the remission, it worked, where they got better, got off all medications, marked improvements, wheelchair to running, uh, and doing great for two years, and then had a relapse. Okay. That person wanted another transplant. I was not keen on doing it, didn't want to do it. It, it went back and forth. I wanted, if relapse occurs, which I've said occurs in anywhere from 23 to 25% of patients giving this non myeloblative regimen that I've used most often, um, the majority, fortunately, even now beyond 10, up to 20 years, haven't relapsed, but but about a quarter will. Uh, and I generally recommend they go on a more standard DMT or another immune modulating drug like just oral cell set. Uh, but in this particular case, it came back aggressively. Uh, the patient absolutely refused any treatment and I could just not ethically let her sit there with her brain on fire. So we did a second transplant and that person has remained in remission now about five years. So the, it's a remission inversion, I think more than five. So it's a, it's a, a longer remission than the first. The second one was the same type of thing. Very aggressive in a wheelchair, uh, relapsed at five years out, but did great for five years. Went back to really hard physical labor type of work uh, and then really wanted a transplant. I was hesitant, we did it. And is back to doing hard physical labor and and doing very well. And that person's actually in the book. So uh, maybe that's a misunderstanding. These people did respond, responded very, very well, got off all medications, marked improvement in the quality of life, marked neurologic improvement. Again, you don't need a fancy scale to go from a wheelchair to running and working mm -hmm. full time. Right. Uh, but they both did that. But the, the two had relapsed, one at two years, one at five years, both went back into remissions doing extremely well with longer remissions the second time than the first time. Now, what, could they possibly relapse again? Possibly, uh, we don't know, but their second remissions are even longer. Mm -hmm. So again, I, my goal is not to do a second transplant. I have a surgeon's mentality, I want one-time treatment and be done with this disease. Uh, fortunately, now in writing this book, when I've contacted people 10 to 20 years out in MS, uh, everybody I contacted now, it wasn't systematic, but everybody I contacted is doing great uh, with no new attacks, no progression, no new medications for MS uh, and marked improvements uh, in their life. Uh, but again, in answer to your question, uh, if it did not work, I would question that patient, if it's a secondary progressive, primarily neurodegenerative, if it's the wrong diagnosis, I would not do a second transplant. If it does work and they relapse some period of time afterwards, yes, my arm was twisted by the patients and I did it in, uh, two times. Right. But again, that's an end of two. And although it's really encouraging, you need longer numbers and longer follow up. And right. that's not been published. But again, uh, if it is published, people need to look at, did they respond with a nice remission and marked improvements and then relapsed or was there no response? It's very different scenarios. Okay. Um, now, kind of along those lines, and especially when it comes to, you said that you, you would look at the, whether somebody may have been misdiagnosed. And I know my neurologist years ago, I remember him saying to me, I don't even know what the context was, but he believed that PPMS was the most misdiagnosed MS. And we never went into detail about it, but it always just stuck in my mind. And I thought, does he mean that the person's actually relapsing or remitting and they were labeled PPMS? Like, you know, what was he talking about? But I'm kind of backtracking a little to the people who are kind of up in arms. And when I say up in arms, I'm just being dramatic, I suppose. Um, but it's people who understandably imagine you're booked for either Mexico or, or, or Russia or wherever. You have PPMS. You see hundreds of other PPMS people who have successfully, and that's the thing when I say successfully, I mean, halt the like take away reversal. If you could take that out of the equation and in my eyes, just say a success is halting the disease. 
they see all these other PPMS people who have had no progression in, well, I've been in this game for 10 years. So let's say it's someone eight years, seven years, six years. They see those people, then they watch our interview with you. And they're like, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm spending tens of thousands of dollars. Or there have been people that I've read and it breaks my heart, but that's why I, I, I just want your view. Let's say I'm somebody who one month ago had my HSCT for PPMS or for secondary progressive with no active lesions. And they've seen other people who have successfully been treated. And when I say successfully, I mean no more progression. I'm not talking about reversal, even though I've seen some reversal in some people. What do you say to those people to either quell their fears or what? why would you think that certain people with PPMS do see success or secondary progressive, with uh, non-active secondary progressive do see well, I guess it would yes. depend how you define non-active secondary progressive. I define it as having a new active lesion within the last year or last 12 months of the okay. time evaluated, not at the time of the evaluation, but within the last year. So maybe part of that is what they're calling secondary progressive in, or subdividing as active or non-active. But basically, um, Again, this becomes problematic. The diagnosis of secondary progressive MS doesn't happen suddenly one day. It's a gradual transition. Oftentimes, you won't recognize it till two or more years have gone by. You realize they're in secondary progressive, but when it happened, it's not at all clear. So as I said, the patients we would do with secondary progressive were referred as relapse and remitting, but we realized they were secondary progressive. If they still had an active lesion within that last year on their MRI, within up to one year of the time of our evaluation, then we would go ahead and call them active secondary progressive and proceed and still will. But otherwise, no, I wouldn't. Again, I think there's a transition when you get into late uh, secondary progressive, it's definitely not gonna help where that transition is you i i don't know and that may be where some of the confusion arises and some people having some benefit and others not having benefit and it's a tough call because you want to help everybody but you don't right. want to false hope and put someone through a procedure that one of the side effects it's it's a low uh, incidence but it could happen of mortality so you don't want to put anyone through that type of treatment if you don't feel you're, they're going to benefit or the likelihood of benefit is marginal. So, um, and I do believe that the late secondary progressives, if you do this, will still progress. So whether that rate of progression eventually plateaus off or is different than the natural history isn't at all clear, that would require studies to understand that. But I don't know that those studies will be performed. I do think once you get into late secondary progressive, you need a different type of therapy, a true neuroregenerative therapy, not an immune reset therapy. If someone can prove me wrong, all the better. I want the best for people, but that's how I started. I had to start when I first started this in late secondary progressive and they behaved just like my animal model. They didn't get better. Uh, so, um, but Did you have any you PPMS at, people in your studies at all? No, but when you look at secondary progressive MS, it's also another factor is going to play in there, and that's age, because generally, uh, I think age plays a little role in in how transplant does in terms of uh, recovery afterwards. Younger people, I think, generally will do a little better than older people. With that said, though. And of course, most older people are not relapsing or remitting anymore. I did do the oldest relapsing remitting 58, and that person did good. But in general, I think age does play a role. The younger, the better. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the interpretation of what you're saying all depends on the circumstances of which I have no idea what they are. Now, primary progressive, I do, it is, it is MS, but it's a different type. It's called primary progressive MS. 
there's another type, they tend not to use that term anymore, but it's relapsing progressive MS from onset. And I've, I've never had a relapsing progressive MS, but uh, that I can think of right now, I'll put that in quotes or caveats, but um, I probably would offer it to a relapsing progressive, but primary progressive from onset, no, I wouldn't. I think any immune-based therapy won't do well for them. Now, with that said, some of these monoclonal antibody therapies against CD20, uh, like Ocrevus or Rituximab has been reported to have some benefit in primary progressive MS. But again, uh, whether that is, I, I just think the benefit is very marginal for this type of therapy, which is a very, which is a very aggressive therapy. So if someone proves me wrong with carefully done studies and reports it, good. But right. ethically, you know, if if there was absolutely no risk, and believe me, any medication, any pill, any drug, any surgery has risks. In yeah. my book, I pointed out how a bag of normal saline, salt water, that's used all the time and thought to be harmless, kills people with scleroderma and has killed people with scleroderma. So, you know, this therapy does have risks associated with it, and you cannot right. take it in a cavalier, nonchalant, like sprinkling water over people. You, I can't anyway, uh, because someone could die. So like anything that's very powerful, you have to be careful when and where you use it and that it's appropriate for that indication. And um, from my experience, having developed the field, having worked in animal models of, uh, with like EAE, both relapse remitting progressive EAE and TMEV and so forth, and from experience with patients and having to start initially with secondary progressive MS by my outside advisory panel, because nobody had ever done it, it really doesn't work. And so... Um, um, and when you say it doesn't work, do you mean no reversal or do you mean no reversal and no halting of the disease? Well, I think in some cases, the disease will not halt. In some, maybe it does, but again, that's not been published and isn't out there. Um, so that's okay. not um, could I would think if you want to do it in progressive MS, you want to definitely use a more gentle regimen. I think these more intense myeloablative regimens may even accelerate it mm -hmm. uh, by causing further neuronal injury. So if you're going to do it, you want to keep it as mild as possible, non myeloablative uh minimize fever a fever could accelerate uh the injury uh and progression uh after you follow them for a year or two fever during the transplant and certain drugs are high do give fever like atg right high fever uh so you know if i was going to do it in a uh, primary progressive, I wouldn't use the ATG, probably cytoxin and rituximab, uh, which is similar to the regimen that they use. I would do it a little differently, but th those are the agents they use in Mexico mm -hmm. and they used to use in Russia. And Russia. And yeah, Russia. So the, um, I would choose that because there's a lot less risk of fever from the rituximab. Fever for uh, injured neurons, they really don't do well. And I think it can further uh insult them and lead to more progression later you know showing up a year or two after the the transplant perhaps related to high fevers during the transplant from the conditioning regimen not from infection but in any event um there's only from my experience i i for me i wouldn't offer this for uh, primary progressive or non-active secondary progressive if there are other centers that are doing that, as long as they are able to follow and report their results, you know, I'll defer to that, but I wouldn't do it. Okay. Okay. Jody, thank you for clearing that up. And I'm, I'm hoping, trust me, I'm going to make sure that all the right people see this, listen to it. So they get a little clarity about what you're discussing. And honestly, I think they're going to find a little maybe a little hope in what you just said about the fact that if you're going to do it, you would hope that they would use a milder protocol 
which is what they use in Mexico and, and Russia. So hopefully that'll give them a little hope. Um, but anyway, Jody, you had a question. I have I have two questions. Um, the okay. one was for for people that are um, non-active secondary progressive or PPMS. Is there any point in doing other treatments like Ocrevus or Mesent or any of the other drugs or doing those but, kind of you treatments? You know, I'm going to defer that to their local neurologist. I don't okay. want to stir up a hoarding's nest here. Okay. Once you're dealing with a disease that's no longer immune mediated in its primary pathophysiology, but instead is a degenerative process, mm -hmm. any immune based therapy, which includes hematopoietic stem cell transplant, you would expect to be not effective or far less effective. So, in terms, I wouldn't treat them if neurologists out there are using certain things to treat them, that I defer to those neurologists. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, the other question I had, and and you might defer on this one too, is there any sort of diet protocol that you have for your patients before or after stem cell? Do you do you deal with that at all? No. No, okay. I don't recommend any changes in diet. I do believe there are some types of diets that are uh, generally make a patient uh, feel better and give them more energy. The low carb diets, for instance, uh, I do think uh, generally weight loss is good for an individual. Uh, you know, there's very few things that prolong life in animal models. One of the things that does is calorie restriction. Um, so these, these are just general good health measures that I would recommend. Low carbohydrates, fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, and uh, or minimal carbohydrates and uh, and uh, weight loss, calorie restriction. Now, um, and I think those can just make you feel better and give you more general concept of energy, but whether they have an impact at all on the natural history of MS, I think that would be stretching it. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, do you have time for one more? Sure. Okay, this is kind of out of left field, but what are your thoughts on the EBV, Epstein-Barr, and its connection to MS? Thoughts? Anything? Well, again, the, the etiology of MS remains unknown. Uh, there are different viruses that pop up ops, uh, off, and the viruses are of the herpes family. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes family virus, but there's also HHV6. And there are others that intermittently pop up as maybe playing a role, and then it kind of just fades away, and then it pops up again. So um, I think for me, the, the ideal etiology behind MS is probably multifactorial, and we yet don't know for sure what it is. There are some interesting studies out there suggesting different things, but at least for me, they're not totally conclusive. Uh, we, I guess one of the things could be done after transplant because about you know a quarter relapse is to see what happens to certain Epstein-Barr virus titers after the procedure. Uh, we do know that they go up but we tend not to follow them because they never get Epstein-Barr virus-induced disease and it doesn't seem to correlate with any kind of acute relapse. Uh, but that type of work has not been done, what I just suggested. Um, okay. And I think it would be worth doing given all the questions that come up, whether this is an EPA phenomena or whether there is some cause and effect relationship between Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, obviously, I worked in an animal model, TMEV, which is a virus that can give a disease like MS. It's a Tyler's, Tyler, Tyler's murine encephalitic virus. Uh, it's a totally different type of virus. It's more like a polio virus, actually, than uh, it's an RNA virus. It's, it's not a DNA virus. It's not a herpes family virus. So, um, but I, I suspect probably a good way to try to answer the question, which I've thought about myself, uh, is to follow those titers after transplant and most people are positive for uh, Epstein-Barr virus, very few are right. negative. 
Uh, it's right. just one of those things we encounter. Herpes viruses, once you get them, like CMV, herpes simplex, Epstein-Barr, they stay with you your entire life. Uh, the question is, does rise, the rising titers of Epstein-Barr with a non myeloid regimen, using a dose of ATG that's six or less, we never get disease from Epstein-Barr virus. So the question is, will that uh, rising titer suggesting reactivation but not disease correlate with any uh, relapse or progression later? I, that's never been studied. Um, so maybe that Interesting. would be to look at. But it certainly is, if you use more, if you use 7.5 of ATG in your regimen, if it's non myeloblative then you can get uh, disease from Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, uh, so it's kind of, uh, you have to use under that dose. And they've had people get PTLD and other things from Epstein-Barr virus using those high doses of ATG at 7.5. I most recently talked a few months ago in Europe about that because there is a center that uses that. And I think they'll now be cutting it down to six where you don't even then need to follow the Epstein virus titers afterwards. But certainly, uh, you know, just following virus titers uh, that reactivate but don't cause disease and see if they at all correlate with any type of relapse is something that could be looked at in the, in the future. Uh, the problem is I would suspect it won't, it might, but I su suspect it won't correlate and then You'd have data nobody wants to publish it. Negative data is important. It should be published, but journals don't want to publish negative data. Uh, it doesn't help. Right. Um, so I think the jury is still out. There's good work being done, but as to what the etiology is in MS or etiologies, it's multifactorial, uh, still is unknown. Okay. Viruses, of course, may play a role. Right, right. Dr. Burt, we cannot thank you enough for all the time you've given us. Um, we've had a we have had a lot of positive feedback about the interview. I mean, it's not all you know negative or, I mean, a lot of people are finding are looking forward to their HSCT. And the fact that there's another choice out there, um, and we're giving them inf your information about scripts, um, and of course they know about Mexico and uh, Russia as well, um, who are all non myeloablative and uh, you are just a wealth of knowledge that we cannot find anywhere else. Like you are the man. So we really, really, really thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. You have a good day. Take care. Thank you. Oh, bye. All right. Bye. So Jody, what do you think? What do you think about everything? What do you think about today and what he said about PPMS and SPMS? What do you think about the people who are out there wondering, did they do the right thing? Are they about to do the right thing? Um, what are your what are your thoughts? I think I think I would still be thinking if I had PPMS. I would still be thinking that whatever benefits I did see from HSCT are still more than any other treatment out there, any other, you know, drug. Um, I would still, I know me and I would still do it. That's just me. That's my opinion. I'm not telling you what to do. But, and especially the fact that he said, if they're going to do it, I hope they use, you know, a more mild mm -hmm. approach, a non myeloablative as opposed to myeloablative, which they do in Mexico. And he mentioned cyclophosphamide, um, which they use in both facilities, Russia and Mexico. Um, so, and he mentioned HEG, which he had mentioned before, um, that HEG causes high fever and yeah. that was the key was to try to avoid high fever so i found that promising if i was listening i would find hope in knowing well at least i'm going somewhere that uses the the less aggressive mm. approach but i mean what what do you think what would what if you were the ppms patient i know you're secondary well you're non-active you're non active. No, secondary. that's what I am. I'm I'm non-active secondary progressive. Um, you know, it's interesting. 
from a doctor's point of view, obviously his primary care is obviously as a researcher, he wants to, you know, get the right people for his study, but obviously preserve life. And, and, you know, as he was talking in the back of my head, I know in moments, and I know for other people with MS, we feel hopeless at times and we're willing to, you know, for that 1% chance of fatality or something like in the, in the grand scheme of things, a lot of times we're willing to take that risk because it seems so low. And for the chance of getting some of our life back, or at least it not getting worse, I think most of us are willing to, you know, it's, I guess it's a little bit of Russian roulette, like you're, you're gambling because it is, it is ultimately your life. Um, but I think for, for many patients, when we're told there's nothing that can be done, we're yeah. willing to go for it. Like I just, Aren't we playing Russian roulette with every single one of the drugs or treatments Absolutely. we had to have along the way? Absolutely. And and the thing is, no one knows how their disease is going to progress. When I was first diagnosed, my neurologist said, I have a very mild disease and nothing would happen. When they say and mild, yet, I want to... Slap them silly. Yeah, I know. So I'm just saying we don't we don't know along the way. We don't know whether it would accelerate quicker if we didn't treat or whether it would accelerate quicker because we did certain treatments. And there's no there's no way of knowing. But but it's it's I don't want to say it's easy for a doctor to say that, but I'm just saying we have to grapple every day looking in the mirror and, and looking at the losses we face. And we personally decide what's worth the risk and what's not worth the risk in our lives. Right. And everyone will come to a different decision. Cause I know other people, you know, with secondary progressive MS that they said, there's no way they would ever do chemo or do whatever. And they just let the progression come what may, because they don't want to do those things. Right. Right. I 100% agree with you. Um, but I, I think Dr. Burt, he really, really cares about mm. the patient. There's, uh, there's no denying that no matter what he will or won't treat, all of his, be, behind all of it, he has a patient's safety in mind. Mm. I think it's, and I honestly, I, I felt in the first couple of interviews, uh, the first two interviews that when, for instance, when I asked him about PPMS in the first, first or second episode, um, and he said he wouldn't treat it, I almost felt the way he responded and the tone in his voice, I almost felt like he was sad. Mm. It was like, kind of like he felt kind of, you know, because he, he does, he wants to fix everyone. I mean, doesn't every doctor want to be able to help all of his patients? And I think that um, in the end, it's all about safety and the numbers for him. And But uh, there are facilities out there that, that do treat non-active secondary progressive and PPMS. And, you know, it's up the, to the patients to make their decision with their family, you know, like you said, every situation is different financially, age-wise. Um, I do think that was interesting what he said about age, that the oldest that he had treated was 58. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Russia has treated, I think, up to 70. Oh, wow. And to ben with benefits, you know, people have seen benefit from it. So I suppose it all depends on what kind of shape you're in at what age. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not to say that there's not a 30 year old who shows up out of shape, you know, overweight, you know, just all yeah. over unhealthy who show up. Um, but anyway, I hope that these episodes help anybody out there considering HSCT to make the right choice for them. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, of course, you and I have had two different facilities, both non-myeloablative. Um, we believe in those facilities. We've seen the benefit that so many patients have seen. Um, and we've been in it. You've been in this game for what, four, five years now? 2018. So yeah. For yeah. And me since uh, 2013. So we've seen a lot mm -hmm. and we hope that 
this has helped a lot of people feel better about the decision that they've made um, or help them to make the right decision for them. And that was the goal of this whole series of interviews with Dr. Burt. So any thoughts, Jody, before we sign off? Um, I think, you know, we talk so much in the MS gym about our mindset and stuff like that. Like so often, you know, that saying, if you think it, if you think you're right, you're right. If you think you're wrong, you're also right. Meaning that whatever you choose to do, you have to believe in it because if you, you know, the whole placebo effect and things like that, like if, if you believe it's not going to work, maybe, maybe in your on the MRIs and other tests will show that it's working. But if in your mind, you think it's not going to work, then you're not going to see the benefits and vice versa. Like if you, you know, the odds could be stacked against you, but if you believe it's going to work for you, you, your mindset will be positive. You will put more effort into your recovery and to looking at the benefits. So I think, you know, there's such a, you know, you can look at all the medical and all the studies, but so much no one can explain the placebo effect and how how much that impacts the treatments that we choose to do or not do i 100 percent agree with you i've said it all this time you can see somebody who is going to have a rougher time with their treatment even during treatment itself and then after you can see them coming from a mile away call them Debbie Downers, whatever you want. Um, and sure enough, every single time I think, you know, I'll read a post from a particular patient, I'm thinking, oh boy, they are going to have a rough, rough road. And not because they're in bad shape. You know, they, they could be in their thirties and in good shape, yeah. but their attitude does not match that young, you know, healthy body. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they come out, they second guess every single thing. Yeah. You know, my toe is tingling and it's never tingled before. I have a fever. I have a, you know, they almost come off. They're like hyper, hyper aware of every single everything. When in fact, you know, you just had your body torched with chemo. Yeah. You're going to feel some stuff you probably didn't feel here and there. You know, obviously, if you could walk before and then you can't walk at all. And that continues for a year. Something's up. Uh, but yeah, I've seen it a million times and that's Dr. Fedorenko. His mantra is good mood, good food and physical therapy. Mm. He says it's all about the mind and the heart and the food. And that, you know, you have, like you said, you have to believe it because you can think yourself sick. Absolutely. You know, you, you can think yourself into a relapse or think yourself into, you know, increased symptoms or. You can do that. The power of the mind is a thing. Like Absolutely. I 100% believe in that, but it works both ways. So let's hope that everybody listening is going to use their positive vibes mm -hmm. uh, to help with their uh, treatment and recovery, recovery Absolutely. for sure. But Absolutely. anyway, Jody, thanks so much for doing this with me with Dr. Burt. It's fun. I think, you know, the two of us having had HSCT, it was you know, we were just the right people to ask all the right questions. And I hope that um, our listeners heard everything they needed to hear. Mm -hmm. No, thanks. So. Thanks for including me in this. And, and I will echo what you said before, Dr. Burt really does have a heart of gold. And, and what you said, I think it breaks his heart when he said what he did about, he won't treat PPMS or non-active secondary. Like, I think his heart breaks. I think he, I, I think he wishes he didn't have to say that, but he has to go by what his data shows him. So he's a very, very, very kind man. So, you know, if I came across in a different way that he was harsh or hard, it wasn't like that. Right. His heart is truly for the patient. I 100% agree. See you later, Jody. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye, Brooke. Bye. Thank you.